He has mentioned that he is not really worried about the energy that is needed for preparing the in vitro burgers. Energy is a, not big, but a huge topic we would like to concentrate on. The next speaker says that this market is six trillion dollars market that is being disrupted. And he's a man who should know about disruption. He worked for Microsoft for 13 years and he was the leader of teams who prepared, that prepared Internet Explorer, Microsoft Outlook or Bing. He owns 19 patents, usually, typically, concern on AI and machine learning. And he is a huge fan of science fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, Rames Nam. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Ramesh, please tell me the very first thing that will come on your mind when I say Battlefield Earth. <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard, Dianetics. <laughs> Not a good thing. Not a good thing. <laughs> Not a good thing. That was the very first sci-fi novel you read, is that it, right? It was. I and was... you didn't like it. I loved it, actually. Really? You, you have done your research. I was 10 years old. How yeah. do you know these things about me, Daniel? <laughs> and you wrote your own novel yes. called Nexus. Yes. That's much better than the first one, is it? It's different. Uh, it's yeah. more modern. <laughs> and you call yourself, and I quote, an overthinker and a dynamic optimist. Yes. Could you tell me what does it mean? I'm an optimist who believes that we take action to make the world better. Anyone can be a passive optimist and think the world will just get better on its own. I'm an optimist who believes the world will get better because mm -hmm. we'll make it better. It's up to you to show us how to make it better in the energy market. Fantastic. Ramesh Nam. Thank you, Danielle. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here with you today in this beautiful venue. As Danielle said, I am going to talk about the disruption of a six trillion dollar industry. Energy may be the single most valuable industry on planet Earth, and it's being disrupted by technology right now. And that matters because energy is not just an economic issue, it is a moral issue. We are in the 21st century talking about abundance, but there are still 1.3 billion people on Earth who don't have access to electricity and modern energy. And you can see the dark spaces in this composite satellite photo. Those are the spaces where either no one lives or people live in almost 19th century existence. And with sufficient energy, we could solve a whole lot of the world's issues with water, food, and so on. But there's also side effects of how we generate energy today. The World Health Organization has updated this number. 6.5 million people are killed on planet Earth from the side effects of air pollution today, each year. For context, that's 10 times the number of people who are killed from all murders and warfare combined. 500,000 in the EU, about 6,000 people a year in the Czech Republic. And the way we use energy is causing this, the warm-up of the planet. It's above freezing, or was last week at the North Pole. The world's temperature has risen by more than a degree Celsius in the last century. The hottest year on record was 2016. Second hottest, 2017. 2015, 2014. The four hottest years of the last four years. And the temperature keeps going up. Now, fortunately, the way that we generate energy is being disrupted. And I don't use that word lightly. Let me show you an example of disruption. This is Peabody Coal. Peabody Coal is the largest private sector coal mining company in the world, or it was in 2011. In 2015, Peabody Coal went bankrupt. And it wasn't just Peabody. The global index of coal company stocks on public markets dropped 90%. It's bounced back a bit. It's only 75% down, but it's not where you want to have your money. Eight different large multi-billion dollar companies all went bankrupt in a two-year period in the U.S. Now, this has happened despite the fact that coal is still the number one source of energy on planet Earth. What's happened is not that we've stopped using it, but after 150 years of coal consumption going up and up and up, in 2013, it peaked and it started going down. 
And if you're selling a commodity into a market where the demand is dropping, the prices will be low and you will be in severe trouble. This disruption that started in the U.S. is now going global. And while natural gas was part of it in the U.S., now what's driving it in the U.S. and globally is overwhelmingly clean energy. Let me show you. We'll start with wind power. Centuries-old technology. In general, people will purchase the cheapest energy they can buy. And today, to build a new coal power plant or a natural gas power plant costs on average six cents a kilowatt hour. I'll come back to that number again and again. In the U.S., in 1980, wind power cost 10 times that, nearly 57 cents a kilowatt hour. But over those almost 30 years, the price has come down by a factor of 15. That's disruption. And now, in the U.S., you can sign a wind power deal at 1.8 cents. If you take away all the subsidies, it would be about 4 cents, a third cheaper than the cost of building a new coal or gas power plant. And, of course, that depends on how fast the winds are. These areas in red are the areas of high wind around the world. But basically, every continent has an extremely fast area of wind. And so you can see these are the prices dropping of wind power in country after country around the world through that red dashed line, which is the line of parity with new coal or gas generation. So driven by policy support and this incredible decline in the cost of wind power, wind power has scaled tremendously on planet Earth. It's gone up by a factor of six and a half in the last decade. Extremely rapid growth. Now in the U.S., it's about 6% of electricity. Worldwide, it's coming up on 5% of electricity, more than that in Europe. And this scaling itself drives the cost down. Something we know about exponentials is that, in general, any manufactured good will drop in cost as your scale goes up, learning by doing. This is the learning rate with a learning curve. So every doubling of the volume of wind power drops the cost by about 19%. And this is a truism, actually, of almost every exponential technology, whether it's uh, synthetic hamburgers or AI or blockchain, which is at first it starts extremely expensive. And so if you want to go into an exponential sector, you have to find a first market that will buy your product when it's extremely expensive. And that allows you to bring the prices down a little bit. And then when the price falls a little bit, you can tap into a new market that's larger. And that in turn increases your demand, and that leads your prices down Again, so wind power has started now becoming competitive in the windiest places on Earth and will scale and get cheaper and cheaper and scale into more new markets. Now, if you really wanted the best winds on Earth, you wouldn't stay on land, you'd go offshore. Because the fastest winds on Earth aren't over land. They're on the continental shelves, just off the continent. But building those wind turbines has been hellaciously expensive because you have to build them out at sea, there's salt water, they have to be twice as tall, there's giant concrete blocks at the bottom. So even just two or three years ago, I would have told you that offshore wind power would never be price competitive. It was only happening because in Europe there was high density, people didn't want it near them, so it got pushed offshore. I was wrong, because this past year we had three deals in the German market where offshore wind project developers bid in an auction model for zero subsidy. They said, we will produce energy from our offshore wind turbines with no subsidy whatsoever. And that's a game-changing price, because from there, the tech will get cheaper and cheaper. Now, an optimist, Bloomberg is an optimist about clean energy. In 2013, they made this forecast of how far offshore wind power prices would come, and they were wrong. We've actually seen a four times reduction in the cost of offshore wind in the last five years, and that reduction is continuing. So wind power will keep getting cheaper. But I want to move on to what's even more exciting right now, because the revolution we see in solar power is really unparalleled in any physical domain. As David told you this morning, in the 1970s, it cost $77 a watt in 1977, and now it's about 30 cents a watt per uh, solar modules. That's now a 250 times price reduction in those 40 years. It's almost like a digital transformation in the most fundamental physical resource we have. And so now we're seeing crossover, the point at which in the sunniest parts of the world, with zero subsidies, solar is just the 
the cheapest energy you can buy, period. Let me show you. Again, about six U.S. cents a kilowatt hour for a new coal or gas plant. In the southwest of the U.S., late last year, we had a 4.3 cent deal with no subsidies in this price in Tucson, Arizona. In the U.S., the price of 20-year power purchase contracts from solar has dropped by a factor of seven or eight in the last decade. India is the country where people most hoped coal consumption would go up, or where coal companies did anyway. In India, we had two record-breaking prices last year, the cheapest of those 3.8 cents, about one-third cheaper than new coal or gas. The price of solar contracts in India has dropped by a factor of four in the last four years. In Mexico, energy reform was passed two years ago, and so now we've had multiple deals at less than three cents a kilowatt hour. In Abu Dhabi, one of the oil capitals of the world, I love this photo, always, 2.4 cents, almost a third the cost of new coal or gas in some markets. Chile beat that in November, just this past November, 2.15 cents. So now you see in country after country that price of solar power coming down, especially in the sunniest places, right? So now, driven by that and policy, the volume of solar has scaled incredibly, not 6.5x, but 50x in the last 10 years. David showed you if you take a hockey stick and you put it on a log scale, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, it looks like a straight line. That's what's happening with solar, doubling every two years. Now, eventually, this will slow. This exponential growth cannot continue forever. But right now, it's an incredible explosion. And again, as the scale goes up, the price comes down, and the set of markets it's cost-effective in grows. Of course, like wind, this is dependent upon geography. So if you're in one of the sunniest places on Earth, solar is now almost unbeatable. Now, here we are in Europe, and Central Europe is not one of the sunniest places on Earth. The Czech Republic is not one of the sunniest places on Earth. So is it possible that solar will ever be big here? In 2010, 2011, you had big solar subsidies. You deployed a huge amount of solar, had second most solar per capita in the world for a little while, and now you're paying for it, right? It's a problem. Can we ever get to solar being cheap here? Maybe. Let's look next door, just to the west in Germany. Here's what's happened to the price of solar power in Germany in the last two and a half years. It's dropped down by more than half in the last two and a half years. Just in February, just actually two weeks ago, you had this deal signed in Germany, four euro cents per kilowatt hour for a utility-scale plant with no subsidies in Germany. And if Germany can get that sort of price, then so can the Czech Republic. And this is not an end-point price. Solar prices will drop again by a factor of two or three over the next 10 to 15 years. Now, if we put solar and wind together on a continent scale, we can actually get about 70, 80% of our electricity. The sun shines more in summer, wind blows more in winter, sun only during the day, wind a little bit more at night. But eventually, we have to crack this as well, energy storage. And this is now one of the most exciting sectors in clean energy, to my mind. You all know who this gentleman is? Tony Stark? <laughs> oh, I didn't give it away, did I? So Elon here, he's the closest thing we have. He's announcing the Tesla Powerwall battery. They took one billion US in pre-orders the first week after the announcement. And the incredible thing is, this isn't really even a Tesla technology. This is a whole bunch of Panasonic cells in a Tesla case. So, so Elon is a brilliant marketer, among other things. But the reason he was able to announce this product wasn't because of a sudden breakthrough in science or technology. It's because lithium-ion batteries also have a learning rate. They're an exponential technology. They've dropped in cost by a factor of 25 or 30 over the last 30 years. And in fact, if we look at just the last five years, in 2013, a variety of people made predictions what would happen to battery prices. Here's the US Department of Energy. They said it's going to be amazing. Battery prices are going to drop by about 35% over the next 30 years. What actually happened was that battery prices dropped by a factor of five in five years. That's what's happened just since 2013. And so I told you that solar gets cheaper as a function of scale. 
batteries get cheaper at basically the same rate. Here's the rate at which solar gets cheaper as a function of volume, and here's the rate at which lithium-ion batteries get cheaper as a function of volume. They just happen to be about a decade behind where solar is. So those prices, batteries are actually still incredibly expensive, maybe 20 cents to put a kilowatt hour into a battery and pull it back out, but they are poised to keep plunging in price, and that's going to be tremendously disruptive. It's going to change the balance of power between utilities that produce power and homes and buildings that consume power that can now store some of it for themselves. So those prices will keep coming down as well. Now, you'll notice I keep coming back to this world cheaper. That's not what we thought of when we thought of clean energy. When we thought about clean energy a decade ago, we thought, okay, we have to do it for climate change. We have to do it for air pollution. We have to do it for our kids. We have to do it for our grandkids. We have to do it to save the world. But we thought, we're going to have to pay a lot of money for it. But if you take these trends seriously, if you take the constant price reduction of technology seriously, you come to the conclusion that clean energy will actually be the cheapest sort of energy on every continent, right? And now even very conservative organizations are saying that. This is the IEA, the International Energy Agency, the world's foremost experts on energy. The IEA is not what I would call an exponential organization. I will show you. Let's look at their forecasts for the growth of solar over time. You have to read from the bottom. In the light blue at the bottom, that's the World Energy Outlook 2002. They said it's going to be amazing. Solar is going to grow so fast, it's going to blow your mind. We're going to have 50 gigawatts deployed by 2030. We had 400 gigawatts deployed as of December 2017. In 2004, they said, oh, our forecast is a little low, we're going to lift that. In 2006, they said, our forecast is a little low, we're going to lift that. In 2008, they said, our forecast is a little low, we're going to lift that. It's almost as if some analyst is looking at their spreadsheet and hitting copy, paste. Right? That's sort of what's happening. Because in fact, what happens is they keep making linear projections. That red line, the 2014 forecast, it's linear. It says the world is going to keep deploying about 50 gigawatts per year. We deployed about 100 gigawatts in 2017. And that number is going up. We'll deploy about 140 gigawatts in 2018. Yet even this organization that has been wrong on every single forecast they have ever made on solar in the entire history of their existence says solar will be the number one source of energy by mid-century. And it will be unbeatable in price when on our rooftop and you don't have to pay for the transmission. Well, here's a, another forecast that I like better. Alliance Bernstein, these are not environmentalists. This is a private equity firm in New York. They sent out this report in 2013, and David showed you this graph of the cost of coal, gas, and oil across the bottom. And across the upper right, when I first saw this, I thought, did someone's kid take a crayon and scrawl on their report? That's the cost of solar coming down. This is a 70-year chart, right? That's the cost of wind. That's the cost of batteries. That is what disruption looks like. This is like a Kodak moment for the energy industry. Kodak moment used to mean a good thing, doesn't really anymore, right? Now, I want to be clear, this disruption is not going to happen in three or four years. We build power plants to run for 30 or 40 years. This disruption will take decades, but it's happening. In January last year, China canceled plans for 100 coal power plants. That number rose to 161. 40 of those plants, the ones in red, had already started construction. Billions of dollars spent never to be recouped. In one month last year, India, in June, canceled 14 gigawatts, 8.9 billion US dollars of planned coal production. And the answer given was clear as day. The price of solar is in free fall in India. So why would we possibly build a coal plant now? The pipeline of new coal power plants around the world basically has dropped to almost zero. Not quite zero, but we're almost done building new coal power plants in most of the world. And now a new thing is happening, because that, all those cost comparisons have been the cost of building a new coal plant versus a new solar plant. But now we're looking at building a new solar plant or a new wind plant being cheaper than operating 
an existing coal plant you've already built. This is a quote from the CEO of Nextera, one of the largest utilities in the U.S. He's saying it looks to him like in about three or four years it will be cheaper to build a solar plant than it is to keep operating their existing coal power plants. Right? Here's a graph from Carbon Tracker that illustrates this. The cost of operating a coal plant in the U.S. versus the cost of building a new solar plant in the U.S. This is averaged out. It won't be the same in every geography. But that is massively disruptive. And in fact, it leads to a death spiral. Because what happens is that you get solar or wind, they start growing, and then the coal plant sits idle for some hours out of the day. But the coal plant costs a lot of capital. So to make that capital back, you have to take that cost and put it on the fewer hours that it's operating. So now its cost per unit went up, which makes solar or wind look more attractive. That's the death spiral. Now, all of that, that disruption is just electricity. And electricity is only one way that we use energy. The other major way we use it is to move us and our stuff around. And that's overwhelmingly oil. And oil is itself, in some years, a $2 trillion commodity. And tiny fluctuations in supply and demand, a 2% change, about a 2 million barrel a day swing in supply versus demand, in a 90 million barrel a day market, drives the price down to 30, if it's 2 million barrels a day of oversupply, or up to 150, if there's 2 million barrels too few. Now, if we were talking about oil 10 years ago, we would have been talking about peak oil, peak oil production, right? peak oil supply. We don't talk about that anymore. The worry now is peak oil demand, like what happened to coal. And in fact, one of the leading oil authorities in the world, Sheikh Yamani, who was the Saudi oil minister during the 70s oil crisis, he's seen this. So he said to his fellow princes about a decade ago, the Stone Age didn't end for a lack of stone. And the oil age is going to end long before we're out of oil. What's he saying here? He's saying the world invented bronze tools, and they were sharper and easier to work with and lighter. He's saying the world's going to invent something that makes oil irrelevant. And that is happening. I was a skeptic even three or four years ago, but now it's clear that electrification is an exponential technology. Now again, I want you to think back to 10 years ago. What did you think of when you thought of an electric vehicle? I'll bet it's something like this. <laughs> right? This is what you thought of an electric vehicle. But batteries are an exponential technology. And so now, we think of something entirely different because this guy, because Elon came in from the high end. Most disruption comes in from the low end, but Elon cleverly came in from the high end. He had a secret plan to change the world, to save the world in his mind. It was so top secret that he published it in a blog post in 2006, actually. You should go read it. You can just look it up. It's on the Tesla blog. And it was basically this virtuous cycle. He said, look, we're going to save the world by making a $250,000 electric sports car that we're going to sell 3,000 of. They're like, that's not changing the world. But we're going to use the proceeds from that to fund the development of an $80,000 luxury car that we hope to sell hundreds of thousands of. Still not world changing. But we're going to use the proceeds of that to make a $35,000 family car that we want to sell millions of. And now we're talking about changing the world. And whether or not Tesla succeeds, Tesla has serious problems, now every other auto manufacturer is going after the same market, sees the exponential in the technology. It's strange to even be talking about electric vehicles because there's more than a billion vehicles on the road, and electric vehicles are a tiny, tiny fragment. There's 0.3% of all vehicles. 3 million, 3.2 million in December. This chart's a little off. 3.2 million in December out of 1.2 billion cars. There is 0.3%. It's like less than a pixel in a bar chart, right? Why would we even talk about this? But the growth rate is phenomenal. 58% growth last year. Put it in perspective, it took 20 years to sell the first million electric cars. It took 18 months to sell the second million. It took eight months to sell the third million. Looks like it'll take five months to sell the fourth million. And again, the forecasters completely blew it. This is the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. EIA. They made these forecasts for the growth of electric vehicles in 2015, not very long ago now. And they said for the bottom line, the red line, how many electric vehicles would we have with a 200-mile range by 2040? 
They said 20,000. How many pre-orders did Tesla take for the Model 3 already? Half a million from one manufacturer decades earlier. So this is exponential growth, and you should bet on the innovators and the exponentials and not on the forecasters that have status quo bias. The forecasters always expect the future to look like the present, and in so many ways it does, but not when you're talking about technology. And now this virtuous cycle kicks back into space, because what's the most expensive part of an electric vehicle? The battery. So as we sell more electric vehicles, we sell more batteries. What happens to battery prices? They go down. That means the whole vehicle gets cheaper, so we sell more vehicles. And that means, again, the price goes down and down. This virtuous cycle is kicking in. And so if we take the pace at which electric vehicles get cheaper and we play it forward, you could have, by 15 years from now, 10 years from now even, a vehicle cheaper than a two-seater smart car. That's the green line. That's a five-seater that accelerates like a Porsche and has self-driving features. And this trend of electric vehicle growth will only get accelerated as we get self-driving. We have these vehicles now that are just simply better drivers than we are. They're not just in the future, they're in the present. This is a Tesla Model S, a 2016 Tesla Model S. It has level four autonomy. You'll hear more about self-driving tomorrow. That will take away a lot of the range anxiety people have, and it will further boost this trend of transport as a service. Because when you get into a vehicle, when you pay by kilometer and not for the capital cost, you get to compare prices apples to apples. Right? One reason Uber has been so successful is that per kilometer, it's usually about half the cost of a taxi. Well, if you make this self-driving, you cut that cost in half. If you make it self-driving and shared, which we'll hear about tomorrow, you cut the cost in half again. And if you make it electric, you cut the cost in half again. Because electric vehicles today cost more upfront but they're already cheaper on a per kilometer basis. Right? Here's a study from London. Here's the cost over four years for a petrol vehicle. Here's the cost over four years for an electric vehicle. As the EV cost drops, we're looking at possibly having half the price per kilometer of electric. So that means every time you call an Uber or get into a taxi a few years from now, it's likely to be electric. So it's a virtuous cycle between these three technologies. And so that's why you now see things happening like India saying, by 2030, only electric vehicles can be sold in India. Or the heads of the energy and transport groups in Britain and France, the minister is saying, by 2040, only electric can be sold there. Now, I don't put a lot of stock into what a politician says about 2040, to be totally honest. But what's happening right now in the world's largest auto market? Anyone know what the world's largest auto market is? China, exactly. In China, the electric vehicle mandates kick in this year, and by 2020, the mandate is basically 5% of new vehicles have to be electric. By 2025, 25%. And that's actually the pace at which the market is going up anyway. This is important for the Czech economy, because if we look at the exports from the Czech Republic, one of the largest sectors of exports, in fact, the single largest export is vehicles and vehicle parts. It's about 35 billion US dollars of exports per year. And this market is being disrupted. It's also important from a global economy standpoint. I told you about 2 million barrels a day of oil demand can change the price to 150 a barrel or 30 a barrel. Well, at current rate of growth of electric vehicles, in about five years, they'll be destroying about 2 million barrels a day of oil demand. I can't predict the short-term price of oil. No one can. But I think I can predict the long-term price of oil, and that will be rock-bottom cheap, because we'll be using less of it over time instead of more. And now others are starting to see this. This is the IEA's forecast for the growth of oil demand over the years. You know what I think of the IEA already? Here's Bloomberg's modification to this. Bloomberg thinks oil demand could peak as soon as 2020. Now, I think that's wildly over-optimistic myself. I don't think it'll happen quite that fast. But I think it's on the horizon. What do oil majors say? Well, here's Total, multi-billion dollar oil company. They say by 2030, peak oil demand. Statoil says in the 2020s. Shell says in the next five to 15 years. 
So this has major implications globally. If you're a nation that gets 98% of your foreign revenue from oil and gas exports, what does that do to you? If you're a nation that gets 70% of your foreign revenue from oil and gas exports, what does that do to you? What does that do to the world? I don't know. We're in for a wild ride, I think. All right, I want to close by asking how you can take action in a sector that's being so disrupted. The Chinese character for a crisis is both danger and opportunity. And there's even more dangers than I've mentioned. We talked about climate change and energy. This field is taking off exponentially. Even so, it's not at all clear that we're moving fast enough. To stay below two degrees Celsius of warming, we have to bend the curve faster and faster and faster every year. And it's still not clear today that we're moving fast enough. And on top of that, to stay below two degrees Celsius of warming, we can only burn about one quarter of the oil, gas, and coal reserves that we know of. So what happens to the other three quarters? They're worth about $22 trillion. What if that asset value isn't realizable? Is that a bubble that gets popped? Is that like the real estate bubble that got popped in 2007? When that happened, did the damage stay constrained to real estate? No, it hit the entire global economy. In fact, this might be too conservative. City, again, purely financially driven, estimates that the actual cost of stranded assets, of assets that go to zero in value, is more like 100 trillion US dollars. That is enormous. But in destruction, there is the opportunity for creation as well. There are, will be losers in this transition, and there will be winners. So how can you be a winner? How can you ride this wave, as David talked to us about this morning? Well, I'll give you four pieces of advice. The first is to limit your exposure, or in technical stock market terms, to cover your ass. <laughs> because the oil price of oil is running up right now. We might have one more spike in the price of oil, in fact, before it's all over, maybe even two. But you don't want to be caught catching a falling knife. You don't want to own this asset when its price goes to zero and you're unable to unload it. So just take care with this sort of thing. Number two is get efficient. Because often the cheapest energy you can buy is to use less energy. And that doesn't just reduce your costs, it lets you sell your products and services at a lower cost and thus gain more share. It's a way to maximize your profits over time. Number three is get flexible. Because today the cost of energy is fairly homogenous around the world, it won't be tomorrow. Energy costs will differ more by geography 10 years from now than they do now. And the cheapest energy will be in the sunniest places and the windiest places. Energy costs will probably also vary more by time tomorrow than they do today. Here's prices in Southern California. The price of energy at uh, middle of the night is cheap. And then in the late afternoon, actually now it's shifting to uh, the evening after the sun has set, it'll be expensive. So can you make your energy intensive processes flexible in time? Can you run them when the energy cost is the cheapest and avoid running them when it's the most expensive? Energy storage is also a way to do that. When I talk to energy storage startups, almost universally, their first business model is, we'll put a battery in your facility, we'll fill it up when electricity is cheap, and you can use it instead of the grid when electricity is expensive. And finally, invest in the future. We're going to spend tens of trillions of dollars in this transition around the world. I invest in early stage energy startups and there's hundreds of different ways to invest in clean energy. And so if you're interested, you can go to this link and get in touch. Now I will close on a philosophical note. David Roberts talked about that Cray supercomputer that he got to touch earlier in his career. Here's my version of that. This is ILLIAC. I went to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. ILLIAC was built there. Second digital computer on planet Earth, built during World War II to calculate artillery tables. And that's an iPhone 6, already obsolete, right? ILLIAC filled a room larger than this. It drew tens of thousands of watts of power. It weighed tens of tons. This is hundreds of millions of times more powerful and it weighs tens of grams and draws milliwatts of power. 
So how is it possible that this thing is so much more powerful than something that filled this entire room? Doesn't that violate conservation of matter or conservation of energy or something? My answer is this. This device is not made of matter. This is not made of glass or rare earth metals or silicon or plastic. This is made of information. This is made of scientific discoveries, of engineering discoveries, of accumulated human knowledge compressed into a small material frame. And the economics of information are radically different than the economics of physical resources. I could break this phone, but we would still know how to build a new phone. You can't break an idea. I could give someone this phone, or you could steal it from me, and I wouldn't have a phone anymore. But if I give you an idea, we all have the idea. And those ideas come into contact with one another, and they breed new ideas. And the right idea can reduce the need for any material resource, can reduce the need for labor or energy or land. It can multiply the value of the resources that we have. It can substitute for what is scarce. And our store of ideas is the one natural resource that we always have more of over time and not less. And that, fundamentally, is why I'm an optimist. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is it about idea, about politicians, about businessmen, about startups, or about general, general public? Who will decide what's going to be the level of sun, wind, and also, for example, electric cars? Yes. The economics, the innovation in bringing down the price means that it's no longer a matter of if, it's now a matter of when. Solar and wind and batteries and electric vehicles will win, but policy can determine the rate. And here in Czech Republic, you have sort of policy overhang from 2010, but there's a chance to learn from other countries and make better policies that will bring the cost of energy down here. Says Ramesh Nam. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Ramesh.